Great. So uh, happy birthday, Doug, and welcome uh, everybody to the conference. Thanks for organizing it, uh, Ati and, and your co-organizers. So today I'm going to talk about FROST, Flexible Round Optimized Schnorr Threshold Signatures, and this is joint work with uh, my PhD student, Chelsea Conlow. All right, so we're going to start by talking about Schnorr signatures. So just a quick refresher on what Schnorr signatures are. So here we have uh, Peggy and Victor. Peggy has a message and a secret key uh, S, and Victor has the corresponding public key Y, which is G to the power of S. This is just the normal setup. And then what is a Schnorr signature? It's nothing but the standard zero knowledge proof of knowledge of a discrete logarithm made non-interactive with the fiat Shamir heuristic. So very quickly, what Peggy does is pick a random blinding factor, little r, computes a commitment to little r, as big R is g to the little r, uses the fiat Shamir to put that big R along with the public key and the message into a hash function to produce the challenge C, and then combines the blinding factor R, the challenge, and the secret key to produce the response Z. And then uh, what Peggy sends to Victor is the message and the signature, and the signature is the pair uh, of the commitment and the response, R comma Z. And how does Victor check? Victor recomputes the challenge as the hash of R, Y, and M, and then just checks this equation, which if you just stare at this equation and take G to both sides, you'll, you'll see that this equation should check out. Okay, so this is just standard Schnorr signatures. So uh, what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about threshold sh Schnorr signatures. So you might not want one person to be holding the private key, you might want this for uh, either redundancy reasons, so there's not a single point of failure, or you might want it for uh, reasons that no one person can authorize an action with this private key. You need some number of people to agree on an action. And this is, of course, uh, gaining in popularity due to the fact that these private keys can now authorize directly the movement of money on blockchains and cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. So. Um, there's increasing interest in these uh, systems where you can divide up the private key. So now instead of S, you have a whole bunch of parties, N different parties, each of which has a piece of S, a share of S. And uh, you can either do this the simple way where you have N parties and their shares just add up to S, or you can do like uh, Mora talked about this morning with Shamir secret sharing, where uh, these SI are evaluations of a polynomial of an appropriate degree such that uh, any T of them can get together and produce a signature. But one interesting difference between this setting and what Mora talked about this morning is that you don't actually recombine the secret in order to produce the signature, rather each party produces a signature share independently, and then the signature shares are combined uh, to produce the signature without uh, ever recombining, ever reconstructing the original secret. Okay, and there are a couple important properties here. One is that if we have a T out of N threshold scheme, then of course we, can assume that up to T minus one parties are malicious and the scheme should still be secure. And also we would like it to be the case that uh, T minus one can even be quite large compared to N. So we can have an honest minority and have the protocol still work. Now, in such a case, the malicious parties can prevent a signature from being created, but they cannot uh, forge signatures or recover the private key. All right, and then another very important property is that the signature created by these threshold schemes should be identical to the signature created with the standard Schnorr scheme. So Victor here should have no idea whether this signature was generated by a standard Schnorr single party protocol or by a threshold scheme. All right, so these are the properties we want. So this uh, 
what has been studied for a long time, including, uh, of course, by our, our guest of honor, uh, Stinson Strobel in 2001, uh, had this paper. And this was, in fact, one of the papers that uh, we leaned heavily on um, when doing this work. So thank you for that, of course. So many previous works, however, including uh, Doug's, the protocol for generating the signatures uh, has several rounds of communication within the, uh, the parties that hold shares of the secret. And for uh, production reasons, you kind of want to minimize the number of rounds of communication. And so there's been a lot of work on two round threshold Schnorr signatures. And here's how uh, those signatures generally work at a high level. So we, we have a whole bunch of parties. One of the parties, just for simplicity, we're going to show the version where one of the parties is called the signature aggregator. This is not really a trusted position. Uh, the signature ag aggregator, if they're malicious, can prevent the recreation of a signature just by aborting the protocol, but they don't have any special power to learn the secret or anything like that. You can, of course, run all these without a, a signature aggregator, but the arrows get more complicated, so this is easier. So what happens here is that each party just generates their own random blinding factor, produces the commitment to it, and then they all just send their commitments to the signature aggregator. The signature aggregator multiplies the commitments together, to form the global commitment R and then sends R and the message to be signed to every shareholder. And then the shareholders just do the same thing they did before. They compute the hash in the same way and then they compute their response share as the, no the same thing they were doing before. Now, all the math I'm gonna show is in the simpler case where you have an N out of N additive sharing scheme. If you have the T out of N threshold scheme, it's exactly the same, except you throw some Lagrange coefficients in, in strategically chosen places, but it all works out just fine. But just to make the slides a little simpler, I'll just show the additive version um, on the slide. So each party computes their response share, and then they just send their response shares back to the signature aggregator, who just adds them up. And then the signature is just the capital R, which is the product of the commitment shares, and Z, which is the sum of the response shares. And then straightforward to check that this is, in fact, a valid uh, standard Schnorr signature on the message. So like I said, this is a two-round uh, protocol. But interestingly, the first round, uh, if you noticed, had no dependency on the message. And so the first round can actually be pre-computed. So the participants can just generate these random blinding factors, produce commitments to them, and just send them kind of in advance. And then when the message shows up that needs signing, it's just a one round protocol. So that's a very uh, useful feature of uh, this kind of setup. Right. So. Uh, unfortunately, there's a problem with many protocols of this shape. And this problem was noticed in uh, an Oakland 2019 paper by Drivers et al. And it has to do with parallel composition. Now, it's well known that uh, zero knowledge proofs often have problems when you try to do parallel composition of them in that the proofs sometimes fail or they're hard to, to get working properly. But here, uh, drivers at all actually produced a concrete attack when you uh, compose many protocols of the form I just showed. Um, in a parallel fashion. So let me show you that attack because it's actually pretty interesting. So in the parallel setting, basically we have a bunch of these uh, protocols, these three message protocols happening in parallel. So in the first message, you basically have uh, the honest party. So remember we have T minus one uh, dishonest parties and then one honest party. 
Um, and we'll call that honest party Bob, and Bob has the honest share SH. Bob has the honest share SH. And uh, so Bob will generate uh, a bunch of random lining factors and commitments to them, and that will be capital R H, capital R prime H, capital R double prime H, and so on. And then the signature aggregator, who may be malicious, because everyone except Bob is malicious, is sending back uh, a bunch of capital R comma M pairs. So RM, R prime, M prime, R double prime, M double prime, and so on in parallel. And then Bob computes the responses in parallel in the standard way, okay? Now here's the observation. If you let our, pro our star rather be the product of all of Bob's uh, commitment shares, and if it happens to turn out that the sum of these hashes with the R's and M's and R prime, M prime, R double prime, M double prime, if the sum of all these hashes equals the hash of R prime Y comma any target message M prime you want to forge a signature on that isn't one of these messages, okay? And we'll get in a minute to, wait, isn't that really unlikely? We'll, we'll get back to that in just a second. But if these two things are the case, then it turns out that adding up Bob's uh, response shares will turn out to be a valid signature share from Bob on M star. And since everyone else is malicious, they can compute their own signature shares on M star and the a uh, group as a whole will have a signature on M star, even though Bob did not approve of it, but only T minus one uh, parties did. So what's going on here is that in the normal uh, way of doing a th threshold signatures, you combine a signature share from each party on the same message to produce a global signature on that message. But here you're combining signature shares from one party on lots of different messages to produce a signature share from that party on some other message, okay? And this sounds very bad and it is very bad, but it relies on this seemingly unlikely thing that the sum of these hashes just happens to equal this other hash over here. But notice that uh, the signature aggregator has completely free choice of these R's and some choice on the messages. The messages have to be messages that Bob would be willing to sign, but the R's basically are completely free choice, okay? And so it turns out there's been prior work in finding sums of hashes that equal a target value. All right, so there have been two prior works. One is actually quite old, Wagner from 2002. And another one is new. It actually came out since this 2019 paper to show that this problem that was brought up in the 2019 paper uh, that relied on the Wagner approach was actually even worse because there's an even better way to solve this problem in some circumstances. So in the Wagner approach, uh, if you have L hashes that you want to add together to equal a target value, and each has output size B bits, then it's a sub-exponential attack in B and polynomial in L um, such that you can solve this. And what the new paper by Benamuda et al. Uh, found is that if L is large, so L is bigger than B, and B is typically 256 or something like that, so if L is large, you can get Bob to do more than 256 signatures in parallel. They actually have a poly time attack, okay? So this is a quite reasonable attack to pull off. Okay, so we have these uh, parallel, this problem that many of the prior uh, threshold signature schemes fall to this parallel attack, okay? so. Uh, enter Frost. So flexible round optimized Schnorr threshold signatures. Here, uh, I'll show you what Frost is and how it differs from the previous scheme. 
the kind of in, the flow is the same. It's still a two round protocol where the first round is can be pre computed. So the difference is now instead of computing one blinding factor, you just pick two. You pick DI and EI, and then compute in the same way as before commitments, capital D and capital E, and you send them to the signature aggregator. The signature aggregator now does something slightly different. Instead of just multiplying them all together, the signature aggregator just makes a list of all of them called B. And then the signature aggregator sends that list along with the message to be signed to all the shareholders. And then everybody uh, does the following computation. So everybody, there's this other hash function, H row, that you feed in the message to be signed and the list of all the DIEI pairs. And you hash those all together to get a binding factor row. Okay, so this is called the binding factor. And then R isn't just the product of the DIs and EIs, you take the EIs to the row. So you take the product of DI times EI to the row. And of course you can compute this as the product of DIs times the product of EIs to the row to save an exponentiation. That's just a uh, optimization in the implementation. And then, uh, then you proceed as before, right? And the purpose of this row is that it binds the signature share to the particular message and set of commitments. And so you can no longer uh, pick and choose uh, signature shares from different messages and glue them together to get a valid signature share on a different message. And from here on, it's basically the same as before, except instead of where we had RI before here, now we have DI plus row times DI. But other than that, it's just the same. And then they send those uh, response shares back to the signature aggregator who adds them up and it's exactly the same from here on in. Okay, so uh, one other interesting property uh, about that some of these protocols have but not others is called robustness. So robustness asks if there are T honest parties, will the protocol definitely complete with a valid signature even if there are also malicious parties trying to uh, prevent the signature from being formed. And in some protocols like uh, Stinson Strobel, the answer is yes, which is the better answer for sure. In Frost, we traded off robustness for other properties, but we still have the property that the miscreant who caused the signature to fail can be identified and then kicked out. So if you have a setting where participants, shareholders are identified parties and not just random people on the internet, then kicking them out means you can then try again and uh, without one of the malicious parties and hopefully it'll work this time. And there's in fact a new preprint uh, of a kind of meta protocol called Roast by Roughing it all. And Roast is a black box conversion of any protocol that is shaped like Frost with a uh, one round pre-computation and then one round of, of protocol um, into a robust protocol in a black box way. So Roast can turn Frost into uh, something robust at, at a cost of uh, multiple, ex possibly multiple executions of the protocol if there are uh, malicious parties. So just uh, takeaways to conclude. So Frost provides threshold Schnorr signatures, even in the parallel setting and even with a dishonest majority, the output is identical to standard single party Schnorr signatures. It's a two round signing protocol where the first round can be pre-processing. So uh, in real time, there's only one round of communication. And uh, we, along with uh, uh, Deirdre Connolly and uh, Christopher Wood, are currently working on standardizing this protocol at the CFRG. Okay, uh, I even caught up on time, so thank you very much.